I can check. Yay! Happy Friday night. Only cool people watch YouTube lives <laughs> on Friday night about flower farming. <laughs> It's the best way to do on a Friday night. Right? Super cool bunch. We'll let people trickle in. I'm sure lots like to watch the recording because I know some people take notes as we go through questions and everything. So hello to people that will end up watching this recording that we post. But thanks for joining us. That's you saying hi. 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 <laughs> it's a good test. It it's is. A good test. I hope we have audio. So. Yeah, can you hear us? <clears throat> Good evening from Pennsylvania. Yay, Pennsylvania. A little bit later in the evening. Oh, there's Rick. Hi, Rick. Got your question. I have it written down. <laughs> Good. Rick said he can hear us. All right. All Fantastic. Right. Well, the title of our live was celebrating 5,000 subscribers, which is super, Woohoo! super cool. Eric asked, and we looked back at our analytics, and he was like, what were we at this time last year? And we were at, like, what, 1,100, 1,200? We had just gotten monetized. We hit all the metrics to get monetized. And, yeah, we were at, like, 1,200. So that's really awesome growth, I think, in a year. Really thankful yeah, for everyone that's awesome. joined us. Thank you for watching and supporting. This has been a fun journey. We're doing this kind of the old-fashioned YouTube way where it's – Slow, slow We're trying tug. Trying <laughs> to not be super clickbait and trying to be pretty genuine with our thumbnails, but sometimes people are like, don't care about your thumbnail. Yeah, we try not to be clickbait, but sometimes. sometimes I know our August one was a little bit clickbait. Yeah. About being closed. <laughs> well, sometimes the title, like planting plugs and tilling, people are like, it's not Yay. super grabby. So sometimes you have to get creative. Like, we're expanding or something like that. Bonjour, Yannicka. Yeah. Thanks, Blake. I think we have a, I don't know how to pronounce that, Doina Mahai or my Mahai. What's that? Right so, yay. So as usual, I posted on Instagram and I posted on YouTube for questions. We got 13 questions. I combined some of them, so maybe technically a little more, which is exciting. But Eric is in charge of the chat. And so if you guys have follow-up questions to what I'm talking about, just type them in and I can pause and answer your question kind of as we go through the list. And as usual, I put the questions that I can answer kind of quickly up top first, and then the ones that maybe would be a little more of like discussion and are likely to have follow-up questions, we'll get to. But it kind of runs the gamut of what, what we're going to talk about. So the first one is Rick's question. And he asked, have we thought about different types of sunflowers? And I'm going to assume you mean you saw our sunflower video and you saw that we pretty much planted just like the classic yellow sunflowers. And if we are going to grow any different other types, like the reds, the plums, the bicolors, the branching, that sort of thing. The Van Gogh. Yeah, uh, sunflower Steve. Sunflower Steve's. Yeah. Um, Hi, yeah. New Zealand. That's awesome. Yay. Oh, that's so cool. Well, they're opposite. So they're like spring. So they're having like their ranunculus oh. and tulips right now. Not jealous, but jealous. Not jealous, but jealous. Yeah, they're warming up. Continues a break. <laughs> but then it'll get cold. Yeah. And then we'll say, where's the green? That's really cool. But for the sunflowers, I we haven't finalized what we're going to grow next year. Um, so I can't say like definitively, but from my research and listening to other growers, a lot of the different colored sunflowers don't do as well for cuts. So they can look lovely in your landscape and in your garden and for pollinators. But the minute you cut them, they can have what's called weak necks. And so they kind of just like drop their faces and don't do as well and can get kind of like soft post harvest, which is a bummer. Cause like, of course my customers are like, I love the red sunflowers and the plums and that stuff. And they just aren't as great of quality. So I'm a little hesitant. Um, this year we grew pro cut white light and white night in May and June when the color palette is more white and pastel and soft for spring. And then in the summer we grew orange DMR, orange Excel, 
and Horizon. I didn't label, which was dumb of me because I can't really tell. Like I, I saw really, little black seeds. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, I really like that one. I forgot what it was. So I don't. I'm either gonna grow a Pro Cut Series Yellow or a Sun Rich um, variety. Sun Rich. Sun Rich, like one word. It's the the brand, like the trademark name. I don't know which variety. It's most likely going to be Horizon because Horizon has an upward facing head. So instead of being like straight on like the classic sunflower, it's tilted up. And when you think about arranging a bouquet, when you have it in the wrap, often the sunflowers that are facing straight out kind of like face into the wrap or like their petals clip the bouquet wrap. But with Horizon, it being more like a 45 degree angle, it kind of sits right there. And it's like, look at me up at the customer. And so those are really popular because of that. Does it move with the sun? No. A little bit, but like it's not. Like a tiny tilt? A little, yeah. It's and like so, the full. <laughs> satellite dish, yeah. yeah. So it'll probably be a Horizon. I'll probably do the white night and light in spring. I will not do them in the summer. Darcy's saying, I tried Sunridge. They were okay. They were okay. See, that's the thing. It's like, I see people, I ask and I read when people comment and they say like, it's like liver diet. They're like, Sunridge was amazing. And then they're kind of like, eh. So yeah, I think I might just stay with what we know and we grow pro cuts and it'll probably be the yellow. Although, like I said, I will do white light and white night in the spring. Our bug pressure is a bit lower in the spring than in the summer. And the bugs love the love white and so it's almost impossible to grow the white sunflowers in the summer here they'll just get too torn up but i mean white in july is not really the vibe anyway so it's okay like a may white sunflower is unique and beautiful with the pastel colors of a snapdragon and a ranunculus and then they can kind of switch to the yellow sunflowers just do a couple more highs hello to moon shadow from georgia oh georgia and then cole's crofts Awesome. Yes, we just finished the last of my tulip stock and snaps. Wow, now. that's so cool. That's neat. I'm ready. Like you've already planted? No, tulips? like harvesting. Oh, is, this, is this New Zealand? Mm -hmm. His spring. She's saying like her stock and snaps are coming in. How funny oh, to think funny. with I your know, brain to flip, flip it. Brain. To flip it. I know. Oh, okay, now I'll try again. <laughs> yeah. Another quick question was what type of grow lights do we use and how close do we put them to our seedlings? We, I looked at my order. It's just from Amazon. It's an LED shop light. I bought it in like an eight pack to save money because that's how many levels I had. And it's 250 watt equivalent, which is kind of standard. And I put them, like if I'm a seedling, I put them about here. The LED doesn't get hot, so you're not gonna burn your seedlings being you, that close. You put close. them a whole lot closer than you thought. You learned last year that if you didn't get close, they would get like they don't work. Yeah, and because they're not like a traditional shop light or a, um, I want to say, they're not fluorescent. They're not going to burn your, they're not going to burn your seedlings. So I put them close and then I notch them you up. You have to put them close. You have to put them close. The yeah. LED type that you get on Amazon from China. Yeah, it's China, but it's cheap. Yeah, cheaper. cheaper. But they work well and they all they like do. daisy chain together. Yeah. Um, you just have to get them a lot closer because last year you had them up really high and like, Things were stretched the sunflower out. stretched and stuff, yeah. And when the sunflower stretches, it's yeah, the plug. Declines. We've learned a lot about sunflowers this year with planting timing, <laughs> but we're going to be doing direct direct sowing next year because that worked really well for us. Save us season. so much time. Got to get the jing cedar though with the right attachment. You mean so we don't drop five so seeds per? Hole. I think we put five hundred in one row. It's like an entire sunflower selection pack. But we were like, borrowing our neighbor's jank cedar and it was the pea sized yeah like seed disc and it would dump like three, four seeds per hole. Perfect. Perfect. Okay this question is largely for you because this is what you help manage. What do we do for weed control? Do we use a weed barrier and just what is our setup in general for weed management? Yeah, we use the whip fabric and I'm thinking about next year going to the heavier duty. There's like one that's called DeWitt Pro 5 and it's probably four mil versus five mil thickness, like very, like, you know, we're still talking thin and uh, five mil usually is just a premium cost. So, so we're doing silage and then we're stripping silage off and then you want to till 
And then some people will let that till, and then if they have time, they'll put the silage back on because that'll kill the, the seed germination that occurs after a till because you bring up, it back up a lot of the seeds back up. Depends on how much time you have. So, I mean, we're, uh, we're trying to fight Bermuda grass and uh, weeds. So, uh, yeah, it's all landscape fabric in each row uh, with the right size hole. And then you got to kind of be on top of it by hand. I mean, you just have to do it especially with something like a Lysianthus. Yeah, we learned. It's so low, like the zinnias start to quickly, like yeah. sunflowers quickly outpace the growing grass and they will shade it out as long as you just stay on top of it. And then next year, next year we won't be doing any landscape fabric for the sunflowers. And so we're going to have some interesting learning um, next year. A lot of- Standby. <laughs> a lot of produce farms will do in between row weeding or they, they bring in like a wheel hoe and they try to break up root structures. Uh, right on top of the plants as you go down the row. So we may have to try some stuff like that to beat back uh, in a more automated fashion because there's no way you can hand weed a lot of the Bermuda grass runners as they get going or any of the other weeds. But then like on a Lysianthus, which since it stays like low to the ground for like three months. Lysianthus status like stays like this and short. snapdragons, <laughs> definitely. Because you got to just go in and pluck, pluck the little one. The competition that tries to bust right out of the same yeah. hole that it's I in. definitely ignored it walking by him a lot. It was like we were getting like stuff like what's called spurge or laspiza, which is like a like this vining low to the ground. It's like an octopus grassy kind of thing. And that's yeah. probably because our nitrogen's a little too low. Um, these are all things we're learning. So we'll probably do some nitrogen supplements yeah. um, in the soil this year to help improve. Uh, reducing some of these things, but then yeah. that makes Bermuda grass want to grow more. So yeah, we use fabric and then it's just by hand largely. Yep. It's a lot. It's one of those tasks where it's like, it's a ton of work and really hard to get in, but then like in the spring, so then it's just in and then you can kind of enjoy it working hard for you all season. And then in the fall, when it's time to pick it back up again, you're angry mm -hmm. at it again as you're lifting up the staples and the fabric. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to try like mid-season when we want to terminate. It's kind of what you would do if you wanted to flip, but we're not going to do a lot of bed flipping uh, since we have the space uh, to put landscape silage on top of the rows to just keep grasses from When a row is done, out. we'll, we'll Especially with the out. lower lying flowers. So Yeah. Next question is, wondering what made us decide to end our season before frost. So we're zone 7A with our last frost date being on average October 15th. And we finished our last sale day on the last day of September. So we definitely could have had two or three weeks more of sales. Um, kind of a combination of logistics and tiredness because <laughs> these would have need to be planted in August. And August is when we take off. And that doesn't mean like we disappear from the farm, but we're just like tearing things down and generally resting. And so what happened was we kind of audibled to do the direct seeding video and to test it out. And we only had so many rows available to us that were clear that we could direct sow into without having to create new beds based on what was already growing. And we basically succession planted in every available row. And then when that was done, it was like, the last row will get us as long as it does. So that's kind of why we ended up sooner. Next year, I'm hoping that maybe we will add a cup, you know, go all the way to frost with maybe like a gamble. Like let's say frost is a week later than average next year. We kind of planted for that. Um, but that'll come down to having our act together in early yeah, we August. Need, <laughs> we need a few more rows for the sunflowers. Uh, so we're going to be planning to expand on that. And then there's also the the fact that the sunflowers actually grew a lot faster than expected. That's a good point. So, so, so that was something we learned very interesting. Pro cuts are typically 50 to 60 days, often like 55, 65 days. And we had rows that were like 45 days, maybe. And... I don't think that they were poor quality. I think they were a little smaller than I prefer because they were planted a little closer together when we did some of our thinning efforts. But I used all of them. We sold out almost every weekend when we had sunflowers. 
Um, but they definitely went faster. So that's a good point. We I think we planned to be selling through at least the second week of March. I think you're right. That, or October, this, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. That's March, a good point. October. <laughs> but they grew a lot faster than expected. And, and it was funny because you had two rows and one was very short. But and the then the other one was really tall. Fun, yeah. So, so there was something interesting going on shorter there. Shorter days, maybe. Cooler nights. Some sort of pushing. Yeah. You think because the days got shorter, they had less sunlight, but yeah. But a goal of ours, because sunflowers are such an important crop for us, is next year to be very focused on flipping beds, constantly succession planting, constantly like one is in seedling stage, one's being harvested, one just got cut down, one is about to be flipped for succession, like constantly in rotation, so that we don't kind of like cap out with availability space. Um, is the plan and that that's an early august task in order to have flowers in october so yeah we'll have a whole we'll new on system that. on sunflowers next year that'll be a, some interesting videos to make to see how that works so yeah. stay tuned right <laughs> we'll see if we can do it a last minute question came in before we went live she asked why do we why did we choose to sell retail and not to florists and i have several answers for that one you make more money with retail because you can charge more. Um, your expenses maybe are a bit higher because you're having to do marketing, those expenses with the flower stand, that sort of thing, or if you go to a farmer's market, but you can charge more. You have to move more stems for wholesale. Florists demand a higher quality than you can get away with with retail. I obviously don't aim to produce B flowers. I would like A flowers for our flower stand, but I'm able to cut a zinnia that has a munch on it or a sunflower that maybe has one brown petal that can still get cut and put in a bouquet in the way that depending on who your florist clients are, that doesn't fly. Um, there's a there's a higher threshold for like stem length, that sort of thing that for me, I was like, I'm not sure I'm ready as a beginning flower farmer and now going into year three i still feel the same way like that pressure of quality especially growing in oklahoma i was like i don't know if i want to take that on knowing i have to charge less i have to sell more and it's a for how i feel a bit more stressful experience than selling directly to customers another reason is I like marketing, I like social media, I like customer interaction. That doesn't make me nervous. Stop. That doesn't make me nervous. What is your address? Yeah, right. <laughs> I answer that question a lot with a smile. Where do you live? With a smile. We are open on Saturdays at 9 a.m. But I like that. And when you sell to florists, typically it's just more private conversations, <laughs> emails, a phone call, dropping off at their business, sending an invoice. And it may be some like very introverted people absolutely love that. And they're like florists. I like being able to talk to one or two people. They put in their orders. I fill it and that's it. I, that's just not what I get excited about. Um, so that's kind of the double answer is I like the retail experience and I like being able to charge more with, for what I feel is a bit less pressure. Do you yeah. feel that that's, like you like doing the retail thing? Versus... Well, I think we, I mean, we like, we like, you know, the home stuff. I mean, we want beautiful property. So we're going for the aesthetic value. And I think we like and enjoy the brand development. Um, why we do YouTube is yeah. to share this story and um, to work on the brand name and have it be recognizable. You know, maybe one day people would go to a florist and be like, hey, do you have Corndale Farm flowers here? Yeah. And you wouldn't get that if you worked it the opposite yeah. like people don't go to a florist and be like oh you're the flowers i've been buying from a florist yeah. so i think we enjoy that marketing like it's you kind of feel self-contained like mm -hmm. you don't feel like you're behind the scenes and sure. that's just a preference thing yeah really you make a good point though we're not saying no to florists like ever um right now i i have said no to florists if their order is like a bucks. size that's not worth my time and i know that sounds like you know, like Linda Evangelista, like I don't get out of bed for more than a thousand dollars sort of like thing, but like $30 in zinnias that takes me a 40 minute round trip to deliver to you, even if I charge for delivery is not worth it. That's like me selling two extra bouquets 
that Saturday and I never left my house. So we've said no then, but if we continue to build our farm and our brand and we there's more demand on our flowers and there's going to be bigger orders from florists, I think we can maybe put it back on the table, but we also like connecting with our neighbors. Yeah. And they come to us here. and we're getting to meet people are like, oh, I live just across the street. And so I think that's enjoyable. Yeah. It's a way to connect with your community. Yeah. So it's not a never, but it's a not right now right. interest. Yeah. Oh, also, I will have to say this does matter of where you live. So we live a little bit outside of our smaller town. There are two florists in town that might potentially buy our flowers that are within like a 15 minute drive. One is always going to make small order and wedding designer. So she's going to want a color palette that I don't grow for retail. So I'd have to grow kind of differently for her and that I don't love that idea. And so if we wanted to get bigger florist orders, we're having to drive into the Tulsa market, which is the big metro city by us, but that's a 45 minute drive. So again, if we decide to expand, I think waiting and building our brand and maybe increasing a demand for our flowers would mean those florists want to place a much bigger order where it incentivizes what will be a much higher demand of the drive and and all of that. And that that matters of like what you have as an option around you. If you if you grow in a city or in a like suburban environment close to a city and you have like 10 potential florists, that's different than kind of like what we have available to us that would make it profitable. So. Yep, one step at a time. Yeah. Thanks, Debbie. We like our drive through too. Yes. I would drive through our drive through if I lived in Rogers <laughs> County. <laughs> we live in a drive through era and history. We People, do. If we could only make it so the flower is like actually. People like, like a quick getaway they just, too. They don't have to leave their car. They can just like. <laughs> Eric joked that we were going to turn our kids into like Chick-fil-A employees and have them like Take with a little them. card reader in people's and cars. <laughs> that would be super cute if we did like a Chick-fil-A Saturday or whatever with the kids. That'd be funny. Okay. These are getting, the questions are getting harder and harder to answer in the way I ordered them. But these next two questions kind of go together and it's how do you know how many plants you need to plant? So basically how do you crop plan <laughs> it so part of it is that you can do math like you can look up okay what am I talking like a sunflower well that has one cut how many sunflower like how many bouquets do I want to make how many sunflowers in each bouquet do I want to have over what period of time okay well then that I know how to plant so like the single ones are easy for like you could do that for like a snapdragon you can kind of estimate how many stems from each plant you would get and decide let me back up you need to decide how much you need and kind of work backwards so if you're like my goal is to make 20 bouquets a week that's where your starting point is and then you can kind of come up with a general formula for those bouquets where it's like, I want to have five focals and five filler, something like that for your recipe. And then now you know, okay, I need to have 50 zinnias a week to go in that formula I just made. Okay, 50 zinnias. And you, you work backwards that way to where you get to the plant and see how many stems you can reliably get from each plant. This is where it becomes a bit more subjective because this is part of just growing experience where you learn your microclimate and your growing conditions of how the plants perform for you and how many they give you. So like maybe someone can get three cuts off of a Snapdragon, but yours only gave you two. Well, that would, could be something you could learn by trying to grow a bunch of snapdragons and you just build on your knowledge with experience versus making it overly scientific because plants don't always cooperate that way. I don't really do that with crop planning of saying I want X amount and work backwards. I've done a little bit more like wing it 
and then work really hard on marketing to try to sell what has come out of the field, I guess. And so like next year, for example, we're not expanding too much for the summer. And so I just kind of know like our rows are 60 feet and this is how many plants I'm going to have. And I can generally set a goal of 50 bouquets a week. And that's that. I know I'm not being super specific because I do think some of it is just trial and error, but you can do that work backwards assessment to at least get you in the ballpark of, do I need 50 zinnia plants or is 20 enough? That that can get you reasonably close. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think flower math is dangerous. Oh I think, yeah. I think most people assume you need a lot more than you would think. So we did, we'll probably make a video on this at some point because we're going to kind of work, we want to work towards something that's like, can you make 10,000 profit from a small flower lot? And I mean profit, not gross. Yeah. You know, what would yeah. it take to do that? Um, and so I think we see, so I did some calculations just on like profit per square foot, mm -hmm. like not profit, but like gross income per square foot. And I would say the average is somewhere around seven or eight dollars. And I looked at six, seven different farms, um, not just here in the area, but nationally. And I think a lot of people waste a lot. Mm. They plant way too much and they can't extract it. They can't sell it. And so it goes to compost. We're, up, we're really right now in the high end um, of profit, of, of gross income per square foot. Uh, and like you said, you can look at it from like, how many bouquets do you want to sell? But I think you, you saw in a flower farming Facebook group where somebody said, give me an 1800 square foot plot and better marketing. I'll take that any day over a half acre, a half acre in production that you're just yeah. going to be tilling all those flowers into the ground. And so you'd be really surprised how much you can extract out of, uh, you know, 130 by 100 yeah, oh, like, uh, like I mean, just fifteen well cared for zinnia plants can give you just as much production as a overplanted, neglected, right, twenty, thirty, or just like zinnias. you can't get to it. You just can't yeah. extract it. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Though think well, small. Yeah, and like you said, learn what your plants do in your area. Yeah. Like how many stems do you get? What varieties work well for you? So you grew uh, rocket snapdragons this year and just didn't like them over yeah. the potomac and so yeah. they, they were smaller and wimpier and maybe that's different in other areas right and then you're the ones that you started yeah the potomac snapdragons they were bigger more luscious and they just grew stronger stems yeah. and they put out more stems and so yeah golden bloom said before she deleted it but she's right she said you also need to plant more than you think to plan for loss mm -hmm. and bugs and that well, I would say what we see is 20% loss on your count. Yeah. So I would 20 say to like 30%. come up with your number and then maybe add 20 or 30%. What Eric's talking about is people that like double what probably was sufficient. And then you're actually just losing money because you spent all that time starting that seed and planting it and watering it yeah, and fertilizing it. And it's just a waste. It's dying on the plant. It's a waste. So yeah, I would say like 20, 30% add on to your estimate and then you're less stressed too because you're like white flies are a problem and they're like stressing the plants so i'm getting less production it's like well you planted 20 percent more and so yeah, maybe we do we do three foot rows and then it's either six inch nine inch or 12 inch spacing so at 12 inch spacing it's uh basically what did i say it's like two times the row length mm -hmm. for the number of plants and that's four times at six inches and then you can kind of do math based upon multipliers like that for determining length of the row. Yeah. So like obviously at six inch, which would be snaps, lizzies, right. sunflowers, you know, you're talking like a 60 foot row is how much should I say? I don't remember. 500? Of what? Six inch for 60 feet is 720. 720. Minutes. Yeah. So yeah, it's like you can do a little bit of math to get you in the ballpark. And take 80% of that. Yeah. That's what you, and then you can do the math from there. Yeah. So, yeah. And then to tack on to that, how do you schedule succession planting? So we... Whenever you can find time. <laughs> yeah. Succession planting is a bit tricky because, again, you need to decide, like, what you want to grow in each season and what your bouquets are going to look like. And I 
the way we have chosen to grow right now, it makes succession planting a little bit easier because we take August completely off. So I don't need flowers then. And in the fall, we grow sunflower, celosia, basil, bouquets, and I might add like a marigold or something mm. next year. And so those are grown just for the fall. So because of that, I don't need to do May through October flowers to succession plant. I really only need to get two successions in. So I typically succession plant like the first planting in April around our last frost. And then I plant that same group sometimes in different colors a month later. And so then I have primo plants in June and primo summer plants in July. And then it's done. August is when things go to crud anyways, so it's done. And then I have fresh flowers that I plant in July, typically early July, that are on their own, that are going to be used in September and October. So that makes it easy to just have like... like the Yeah, like the Solosha, having two chunks. If you aren't going to do that and you need to have August and September flowers, then you're probably looking at like an April plant, a May plant, and a June plant to get you all the way through for summer flowers. For spring flowers, with what we grow, I don't succession plant. So I don't succession plant tulips. I don't succession plant ranunculus or snapdragons because by the time those are done, our summer ones are just gonna pick, our summer flowers are just gonna pick up. And so I don't need to stretch them. It's kind of like, I enjoy them for the three weeks, four weeks I have them, and then we're on to summer instead of stretching stretching them out the, sun, I think a the month sunflowers apart, will be different they'll be in every week sunflowers are one every we're, week we're gonna try to have 10 rows and then 500 planted per week just go yeah. one row at a time and then hopefully that means by the time you get to row 10 row one is harvestable and you, repeat you cut it down silage it a couple of weeks kind of so, so like that'll be a much different timing than like yeah. cinnias lizzie's snaps mm -hmm. status yeah so I would say about a month apart, I find is good for summer flowers to succession plant so that when they're trying to like wind down a little bit, you have a fresh crop ready and then you're less stressed about when disease and bugs or they just slow down. So right. August, they're very rough. That's another reason we take it off. The bugs, oh, yeah. the bugs are super high pressure in August and our grasshoppers are ginormous. Yeah. The Jeez. spacing we do for sunflowers is six inches is what we aim for. Now that we're going to direct sowing with the cedar, it becomes a little bit more variable than when I planted them from plugs into landscape fabric. It could be perfectly six inches. And so we find a little bit of variability, but we try to hit six inches because I find when they get closer to four inches, they are much smaller and the head is much smaller. If that's maybe what your florists want or that's your aesthetic for your bouquet and you want a bit more of a petite sized face, then go closer to four inches but I want them to be like five or six inches. doing, yeah, I want them to be like a workhorse in the bouquet. So I want that like bigger classic, but not like a broomstick handle, which happens when it's like nine inches. Verna, okay. Verna Flower Farm says in Minnesota, snapdragons work all summer. It's really yeah. wicked area. We will get frost tonight. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we're chilly true. tonight too, but we're not, we're not frost tonight. No, that she makes Our snapdragon good. second bloomed, but we didn't, they weren't as good. She makes a good point though, because um, in in some places where the summers aren't quite as intense, you can get more successions in of some of the flowers that for us are kind of like spring flowers and we're, we have to move on to like the heat loving celosias and zinnias and basils and, and snaps would have a much harder time sort of thing. Yeah. So again, climate, climate does matter. And again, dahlias, like not happening in Oklahoma. If you're in Minnesota, I'm sure your dahlias are jealous. Beautiful, but not for us. They work through what? Like end of May? <laughs> yeah. So next question. Um, do we have a variety list of what we grow? Yes and no. I can tell you now, I can rattle off the general varieties of what we're growing, but I don't have the like the specific, specific breakdowns of each variety. I was talking to Eric and I know, especially new growers or people that just want more information, it's hard on YouTube to kind of like hope you get your question answered 
or you just have like a million more follow-up questions that you could just wish you could ask and just talk with someone about. So Eric and I are considering offering more like a consulting option where you can have a phone call with us and it can be, be all about your farm and all about your questions. And in that environment, I would be happy to go like really specifically through a lot of what we're doing that tends to be a little more detailed than we would put in a video or we would be able to answer here, you know, in like a 90 second clip in a live. And so if that's something you might be interested in, definitely DM me on Facebook or Instagram and we can maybe talk about options for like a consulting phone call because we'd love to be helpful and share like really detailed information. But sometimes like such a big question, like full variety list, I can't really go through. But off the top of my head, you can see if I can do this though. We are doing daffodils, tulips, ranunculus, anemones, snapdragons, bupleurum, larkspur, status, lisianthus, zinnia, marigold, basil, celosia, sunflowers is our whole girl list. <laughs> and then obviously there's the sub varieties that we choose and have opinions about like why we choose different colors and series and groups and all that super, super detailed, but yeah. Hello, Verna. And hi, Deborah. Awesome. So Deborah says, put a bird bath near your crops <laughs> to encourage birds. To come yeah. To we're going to probably work on maybe some chickens once Sorry. some plants are more mature. And then, yeah, um, yeah we would, I think some bird perches would be good closer by. We live, it's encourage kind of an open them. field. They love to perch. We see them out there. They love to hang out like the little uh, yellow finches. Come, they have wonderful yellow finches. That come and uh, they sit on top of the big sunflowers. And they like to peck out little seeds yeah. from the sunflowers. Yeah, but it's true. Always encouraging natural predators in is always super helpful. The next question goes with what I was saying before. Oh, yeah, before. she got caught. What I get caught? The Life Gardens by Debbie. Don't you, didn't she plant a bunch of peonies? Haha, paying attention. So I didn't include them because... Couple of years. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to cut on them yet. So it's one of those wait and see. So we planted a uh, like long game in flower farming is getting those peonies and tending them for I years while well, they do nothing but put um, up like one flower. We water them <laughs> for years. We planted like 100 last year. We're going to plant a ton more this year. It'll be super fun. In November, we'll have a video. We get to go over all the varieties and planting. But those, again, probably not until I hate to even say this because it sounds forever away, but 2026. I'll be able to add peonies to my May bouquets and harvest. So we're planning for it, but my goodness, it feels so far away. The next question was, can we share our calendar of tasks? And so that goes a bit with what I said about the consulting. What I realized, I was talking to Eric about this question is, you can never, you never know with YouTube, like what's really happening and how much is real and whatnot. But our videos that we put out are very much accurate to what happened that week. We don't have like a long lag time in our editing process when our videos are like, we don't put out a video and it's like that actually happened three weeks ago because we got behind. We're typically filming like Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Long. Yeah, I post it Sunday morning. And so when you're watching the video, it's like we just did that. And our goal is in our videos to kind of show you everything we're doing as much as you know we can. And hopefully that can also help as like, you guys did this task this week. I can do it next week or I can plan to do it sort of thing. But if you wanted to get like really specific, like write down a list, I think that would be like a great topic for a consulting call to really get down in the weeds of like exact breakdown of tasks. But just so you guys know too, like our videos are not lagged, like they're very much live of what we're working on that that particular week and same with our sales that we share and stuff but oh this is the favorite question of everyone marketing marketing question um they said would love to know more about how you do your social media posts the question person is in a few groups that only allow marketing posts like once a month or only on monday sort of thing and they'd like to know how to get more engagement and more followers. I would say I don't post too much in groups. I will post in like, we have a what's going on Claremore Facebook page, <coughs> excuse me. And I'll post like Saturday morning about the stand. 
but that's it. I don't really post much more in that because I think people kind of will tune you out if it feels just salesy all the time. Most of my effort is just in, uh, was just on our page. Um, we're going to do a full breakdown video on marketing and I can collect my thoughts and have it be much more specific. And I'm not saying that to get out of answering the question, but more so because it's, I think, a little more complicated that can be fully, fully answered. But as I always say, like the biggest thing to do is consistency. Like you need to be posting five days a week, minimum. We post seven days a week. I think it's okay to drop a day. Five days, I would say minimum to get keep the algorithm primed and to be creating content. Another way you can do it is the way the algorithm works is more engagement that you get on your posts. The more Facebook thinks people want to see your post and then they'll show it to more people. And so if a couple times a week you can tailor your posts to get customers to answer. So, for example, if you go look on our page on Facebook, if you scroll down, I think it was four days ago, I posted about zinnias and I posted a collage of like five different color zinnias that I grew this year. They were my pictures, but you can pull them from Johnny's. Um, or, you know, another seed catalog person. And I said, like, can you believe it? It's already time to order zinnias for next year. I would love to know which colors were your absolute favorite. Yes, it helps me seeing what my customers say, but it also is very much like engagement farming because I think I got like 42 comments or something. And that's going to tell Facebook, like, people are interested in this, con this post. They want to stay on the platform. They want to talk about it. And so I got more follows and people saw more people saw the post. And so I think instead of just being like a picture of a sunflower and saying like the most beautiful sunflower bloomed today. OK, like that's not bad. You're not being dishonest, but it's not something that like pulls someone in to necessarily like it or comment on it. Um, you yeah, can kind of get the feedback. Yeah. So asking the questions. <laughs> you're doing the surveys you're trying to say like here's something you can do like you talk about you get towards the end of your week like you can come buy our flowers here's when you can do it it's like it gives people like a to-do list yeah. in some regards and you are collecting media all the time yeah like always be taking pictures always be taking and taking pictures. little little video clips like build a library and just have it ready for anything. And I think it'd be good. Like we should, if we make that video, you shouldn't create like a brainstorm list of like post ideas. That's a good idea. So I think a lot of people get brain freeze and they're like, I know I'm supposed to post. I'll write that down. But I don't. It's like pull up, pull something out of the hat and be like, okay, today we're gonna do this kind of post. Yeah, like a like a customer question post. I do a lot of that in the winter when it's like I have nothing to say in January. What am I gonna say? I'll do a lot of like I remember last winter I did a this or that series. So like once or twice a week, I would post like a picture of a pink ranunculus and a yellow ranunculus. And I would say like this or that, which one do you like? And then people would be like, pink, yellow, I hate yellow, pink for life. <laughs> and it like, you know, I didn't, it didn't do anything for me in the sense of like, I had already picked my ranunculus and they were already planted, but it got people talking and stuff like that. When you have flowers, you can do a giveaway. You can ask your followers to share. Your post sometimes is just easy to just ask. Be like, we're trying to get the word out. We are so thankful for our customers that have bought flowers. If you've loved our bouquets, would you be willing to share our account with your friends? Or, you know, can you post, can you share this post on your own feed so other people just ask sometimes? And people are like, oh, I, yeah, sure. Click the button to share. That was an easy thing. And they asked me of it, happy to do it when they might not have done it on their own. So your guy's action is to hit that like button right now. Yeah. I am going to ask you. There's 25 of to you in push here. the like Only button. Eight of you. Like. I am asking for the like. No. I think this is probably why a lot of flower farms do like the dried flowers at Christmas or the wreath making. Like they try to think of some there was someone activity. Whoever just liked it <laughs> proved the point. <laughs> yeah, look at there you go. Oh, so loyal. You just forget. You forget. Yeah, People exactly. forget. I mean, I don't know. There's not a dishonest thing. You just forget. I've watched so yeah, many videos that are great, and you forget to hit the like button. They weren't actively disliking the <laughs> video until we asked. <laughs> <laughs> and then the follow-up question to that was, this is clearly someone who's starting their flower farm. They said, when you were just starting, 
did you create separate social media accounts? And when did you start posting on them? So we started our farm, like we picked our name, we worked on our first logo draft and stuff. January of 2022, because 2022 was our first year. And I immediately got a Facebook page set up and an Instagram page set up. In the beginning, I just used our logo. Now we have pictures of like our faces and our, our flowers that we've grown ourselves. But before that, it was our logo. And I immediately started posting. I think it is completely wrong to think I can't start marketing or posting until I have actual product. I think there is so much you can do leading up to build a story about your farm, to build a story about your brand, to connect with customers and to get them investing in what you're trying to do and build that isn't going to start at the end state. The end state is come and give me your money for my flowers. You can do so much work leading up to that. And I think we kind of psych ourselves out thinking like, oh, I know we all have our favorite flower farms. I'm sure that we follow on Instagram and drool over their pictures and are like, this is incredible. And you're like, well, I can't, my feed isn't going to have this like perfect bunch of 50 dahlias with beautiful golden hour lighting. So I don't know what to post because I don't have that kind of content. And I just don't think that that's the right or best attitude in coming up with content. I think in the beginning, it's not so much about the end state perfect product and about bringing people along on a journey. And that's a little bit, I think of like what we've done on our YouTube, for example, and this is considered social media. I mean, my goodness, you go back and look at like our video that's like creating our flower farm. And it's Eric and I building out the field for the first time and doing landscape fabric and cutting drip and like complete noobs. Like, we were trying to figure it out. We did stupid things. Eric tilled his hat. Like it was just nonsense compared to like. And then attached the tiller right and the whole tractor wanted to drive off. You almost drove the off into the pasture. And I mean, we look back at that video now and like we're way more polished. But if we just started making videos now, there'd be so much loyalty and like interest lost for people that watched our videos kind of more from the beginning and saw the growth and saw the development and the build out. So don't wait for like the shiny, perfect florette pictures to start feeling like you have content. I mean, like a seed tray, a seed packet, an empty field, all of that you can craft with your mm -hmm. caption of taking people on this journey. I think it could, yeah, you got to kind of have a muse, right? Something that inspires you and what you're thinking about. And I think most people that interact with this are like, I mean, there's so many people that have never done this before and they don't have any clue. Like, what does it take to just turn a patch of grass into something that you can grow in? Yeah. I mean, you got to think like this is novel stuff. And I think the other thing about marketing, this is hard for me. It's better for you is you can be repetitive. Yeah. You can be very repetitive. That's another thing. It's very much task oriented where you're just, you're drumming the same beat over and over again. Like, where's your address? <laughs> yeah. For example, like when are we, you open? we think, I think we just assume like you post, maybe this is just a subconscious assumption, but you post something on Facebook and you kind of naturally assume like, okay, I have a hundred followers. I posted something on Facebook. Those hundred followers saw the post and that's not the case. The algorithm might not push it in their feed. They might be off Facebook for a couple days and they just missed it when the algorithm was trying to show it to them. And so then you think like, well, three days later, I feel like I'm saying the same thing again, but in the eyes of most of your followers, you're actually not. That's like the first time they're seeing it. And like we have, and sometimes I have to remind myself about this. So sometimes I get sassy, frustrated because I spend a lot of time on social media and posts. We have 3,500 followers on Facebook and I will post for like four days straight hyping up the flower stand. And then I'll have a follower message me on Saturday and say like, I didn't know you were open. I didn't see your post. And in my mind, I'm like, I have posted four days in a row about this. What's the problem? Should I keep drumbeat. Yeah. Open and like, Saturdays, 9 to 12. Sometimes open Saturdays, you're 9 just, to 12. Open yeah. Saturdays. Especially when you're on the growth slope, the likelihood that somebody that just joined or just saw it they haven't seen anything in the past i mean it's like your yeah that's your a good audience point. is expanding so much so just keep repeating yourself 
Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And if you're just truly starting out, you're starting at like ground I pretend zero. like I know marketing right now. I know. You're very smart with that <laughs> stuff. You listen to me talk about it a lot. I do. If you're just... <laughs> If you're just starting out and you have like no followers, I would just start with like friends and family, ask them to follow you, like get that number up as high as you can, maybe like 15, 20, like get, get it primed a little bit, ask them to share it on their pages because they're going to have other friends and stuff. And so the orbit will get, the radius will get wide bigger, you know, as friends, cousins share it. And you can kind of like, that's a kind of an easy way to get closer to 100 or maybe 75 and then like really start that consistency and just be patient. Like it's not, it's not a viral thing. Like you're not going to wake up one, I'm not going to wake up one day and go from 4,500 to 4,000. It's not going to happen. It's like, I get like a couple a day and it's just like a consistent chug of patience. And well, what it, were you at Facebook at the beginning of the year? At the beginning of this year, maybe less than maybe a thousand. Maybe less than a thousand. Maybe a thousand at the end of 2022. Maybe not. Maybe 500. I know on YouTube. Maybe I can't look at we the analytics. We were at a thousand uh, followers by September of last year. Yeah. And now we're 5,000. So that's four times in one year. So, I mean, it is exponential mm -hmm. to a degree, kind of. I just meant viral in like one week. You it, just get like a crazy No, I know. But I'm just life. saying like it, but it is, it's like, it's like a little mass. It's like 20 yeah. people, then it's 40, then it's 80, you know, yeah. and it, it goes through a doubling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question. So I could talk about marketing all day long, but I genuinely am putting notes together and put a video together. And hopefully that video becomes something you can like reference or go back to or take notes. And it's kind of like all consolidated instead of, I know I've mentioned it in like other lives and it's kind of like these pieces of info all over. I'm going to try to consolidate it. So that's coming. But you're, I mean, the two tracks for flower farms are going to be wholesale or retail, largely. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be retail, you've got to put as much time in your marketing as you're going to put in the dirt. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, there's two final questions and they're bigger questions. And I think they'll be interesting because they're a bit more like philosophical business thought process questions than technical growing. First one is, it says, you guys are a second year flower farm and it looks like you jump in big with lots of flowers and bulbs and expensive equipment. Do you mind sharing if you're profitable yet, or are you still in the growing stages? Do you Ooh. want me to start or you? We are profitable this year on this year's expenses. Explain and that, in that, because that's important and how you think about your expenses. Right. So there's the way U.S. tax law is, is that you take your losses in the year they occurred. And so last year, yeah, I bought a tractor. And then we also bought that uh, cottage shed structure. It's not a shed. I know. I can't call it cottage. It's, it's a, too early. It's a flower cottage. It's a flower. You built it. Domain. so <laughs> It's an outbuilding. It's a flower fortress. It's an outbuilding. So. <laughs> outbuilding. And there was a lot of choices we made to make it fancier. And obviously those costs added up. And there was a lot of costs that you didn't have to, to do. Uh, I like the tractor. It makes work a lot easier and it makes getting things around a lot easier. Um, those are all different choices you can make. But so like in this year, we were profitable. Not much, um, but, we were. but we were. And that's not average. Um, no, not in second year. So the next steps will be to increase profit. And so I, I really think you have to work hard on your expenses. Um, I will say, so I think it's a, it's, we're not big. It's a, yeah, it's a little bit. I made a couple of bougie choices. Like the tractor is definitely, you could have gone like a BCS or borrowed or used or rented. You could pay someone a to roto tiller. tiller to break your ground or you could, yeah, you could see, I mean, if you live in a more rural area, I'm sure somebody has a tiller out there and they would take a couple hundred bucks to bust your fields up for you. Um, so there's tons of options yeah, there to have saved it. that cost. Yeah. And the outbuilding is obviously you could do it either on the low or whatever, but I mean, we chose a very small facility compared to like what we some, have a barn. Yeah. We didn't do a giant pole barn, yeah. uh, which would have been, and I did a lot of labor myself, uh, which saves a lot of money. It so. Does. so I think it's a little bit subjective in that. Yes. The cottage and the tractor were clearly the big expenses that were not essential, but were important early on investments for us to make life just a bit easier and enjoyable, but they weren't like crucial. Like there are other workarounds, like Eric said, I think though, personally, 
I think we have grown with our customer base. So in a sense, we've gone big, but we haven't gone big and lost a bunch of money because we went big. So in our first year, we did not do spring at all. We started, I think our first sale was like the first week of July or second week of July. We did July, August, and September. That was our first year. We just did summer because summer flowers are way easier. The cost, it was just seed. It was way low expense, learn a lot, and then go bigger the second year. And I think that's really wise. I kind of freak out when I see first year growers buying ranunculus and starting with stock and spring. And I'm like, Ew. I maybe try a summer and like nail some things and knock it out of the park and start building customers and then start adding on shoulder season and more complicated ones. So going into year two, we did, I think again, scaling up what I would see is a little bit slower. We did a big tulip order. We did 2,800 tulips. I did not grow ranunculus commercially like for, for sale this year, I grew 50 corms in my raised bed to trial, not even 50, like 30, to trial and learn. Because again, it's another expensive bulb. I'm new to Oklahoma at the time. And I was like, I don't want to have a huge loss. I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to learn this flower, take a bunch of notes. And then in year three, we have a big ranunculus order. And so I've tried to be reasonable in that sense of how we're investing and trying to mitigate like big crop loss because I'm not, I'm not an expert in some of those flowers yet. But at the same time, because of marketing and just how things have gone for us, we're scaling up with our customers. And so we're not planting a quarter acre our first year and having very expensive compost. Like we harvested and sold, I think, about as much as we could this year. Like I think what we produced matched the amount of customers we built up at the flower stand. We weren't composting a lot of bouquets. We weren't leaving a ton of product in the field and it was growing. And so when we make our decision next year, we are growing to mat what I think will match what our growth in year three will be for our customers. And so for us, that includes investing in a, in a, a caterpillar tunnel and increasing our spring flowers because they were much smaller this year as I was learning things. So yes, on the one hand, we spent a lot of money on maybe some equipment you don't need for sure, but I've tried to be really reasonable about not jumping into the deep end in the first couple years on stuff that's really expensive or just really finicky and takes some time to get to know well before you scale up to like a cuttable amount. So in my raised garden, I'm always growing like a trial. Like for example, I'm going to try to grow scabiosa in my raised garden because I haven't grown it before. I'm not devoting 30 feet to scabiosa and potentially screwing it up and losing that money and losing 30 feet of space in our field to a new flower. So it's kind of like a yes and a no answer of jump going yeah big, that's why i think next big. year we would we would probably come up with like an essentials kind of like a so you want to start a flower farm yeah or how do you make 10 grand profit and then really talk about expenses and we've been really keeping a track of those this year um so i think it's possible i think you see a lot on youtube that don't seem profitable and i don't think that the expenses are being controlled well um and you don't, I mean, you don't have to do the tractor. You can do any, there's a lot of other options yeah. to break the ground. And the, the additional facility could have been something far simpler. Yeah. Um, well, we were just in our kitchen the first year. So that was, right. I was making, not, couldn't have done that this next year. Not much was but I could year. have done the garage. I mean, like I could have. Convert, Wouldn't have loved garage. it, but I could have. If we're, you're really. Yeah, I mean, we bought, we bought, you know, fridges from, secondhand like mm -hmm. aftermarket or you know scratch and dent sales yeah we don't like have that. a fancy cooler we didn't spend money um, on that didn't, yeah i didn't do the cool bot we didn't um, do peonies until i bought like the cheapest plastic flooring you could find at uh, the low store here <laughs> um, like the walls in that cottage i mean like there was, no, there was i'm just saying like there's there's some choices that you just make you don't have to be max bougie 
Xander but said Xander said he loves that you're flower fluent and involved and wants to know whose idea was it to start the flower farm? That was my vision. Uh, when we moved here, I said, why don't we try to make what's called economic use of the land, which used to be normal for every single person in existence, that you, if you owned land, you'd have to either grow crop or do something with it. And I said, hey, let's, let's try to do that. And my wife happened to be very interested, and she's a fastidious learner, and we were growing many flowers at the time, and many relatively, like as a home garden. Yeah, raised garden. Set up, and, and roses, and tending to them, and she wasn't killing them, so I assumed you're that like, she, she onto something? maybe she has the ability to do this. And half the time, the ability is your willingness to learn, your willingness to observe, uh, your willingness to read and listen. And work hard, yeah. And then just work, put in the hours, and so, um, if you have that. There are no Instagram farms. <laughs> you have to create them. Last question that I think is along these lines that I really like, and if you have any last minute questions, put them in. But after putting in the high tunnel, so I said we're putting in a high tunnel this year. That's Eric's October project. Putting in the high tunnel. Do we have expansion plans for 2025? Or do we gauge what's happening on a year to year basis when we're deciding how to expand? Like, how are we making these business decisions each year? Is there a set goal we're working towards or are we kind of deciding each year? That's important. That ma that really matters for your business of how you're thinking. Yeah, about I mean, it. I would say for anybody doing this, I mean, you need to set. We're, we're being super conservative. I mean, outside of like maybe the tractor purchase on an expense list, like everything else we've decided, like I said, build a get one $320 silage from uh, Johnny Seeds or Farmer's Friend or whatever, mm -hmm. 30 by 100 feet and just say like, cut it in half. I say, I'm going to try to master and sell the maximum amount of a 30 by 50 square that I can. I'm just going to master that space. And then the next year, master another space. Uh, grow, grow your row length because the longer rows are just more efficient. Um, start with that and just see if you can build your audience. If you have patience to it, I think that, yeah. So, I mean, to answer the question, it's like, yeah, we're taking it a, a step at a time and there's capacity limits that yeah. you have. I work full time. And so I do a lot of this work on evenings or Saturdays um, to help with the like meta infrastructure side of yeah. the house. But I think it's it helps to have a husband who's into it, yeah. in, like I'm fully supportive <laughs> and wants to, uh, you know, help with that and infrastructure yeah. and build the business and, and be supportive of that and have some skills to bring to it. So a joint vision helps. I would say it's important from a, like a meta perspective to kind of with your spouse talk about like, what do we enjoy? What would just be really joyful and, and, fun for us to do considering our personalities and skill sets and also like what are our non-negotiable boundaries around it and those will limit a bit what your options are and so like Eric alluded to it but like we homeschool our four children Eric works full-time and the flower farm is not a full-time job for me it is part of our family business and I work on it when available, but homeschooling the kids, being a wife and mom first is the non-negotiable. So that already puts a bit of a ceiling on what like my capacity is for harvesting and making bouquets, for example. Like we have the property, we have the knowledge, we have the discretionary income to plant a half acre. I don't have the time within our found family boundaries and goals to harvest and sell that much and so that's yeah it would just be wasted so that's automatically a cap and that helps kind of like focus our business for example as of now and i think pretty firmly i'm not interested in having employees i'm not super interested in running payroll and the like business employee side i did this because i want to work a farm with my husband and my children by my side and teach them and so that also, in a sense, can put growth boundaries on what's possible for us. You might have completely different considerations. You might have different goals on what your like five-year goal plan would look like. And then going year to year, I think the wisest course is to grow with your customers instead of grow your max and then think the customers are going to catch up to your growth because you see farms that are like year one year two even year three 
And they just plant out the equivalent of like a year seven, eight farm with a year seven or eight customer base and florist client list. And you're like, where are you selling the flowers? It doesn't matter that you can plant this much. Can you harvest that much? Can you store that much? Can you sell that much? And usually the answer is no. And then you've created very expensive compost. So I think you need to set like big goals and then year to year realistic. Are we making profitable choices based on who, who's buying our flowers and our customer base? Yeah, they get a lot of patience, observe your land. Like last year we planted and realized that one of the fields we chose just floods in the spring, uh, not a good place to plant. It's a low spot, yeah. And uh, so observe your land, observe how the water flows through it. Uh, think about irrigation and what you can do, how much you can do by hand. Uh, observe it and be patient towards it. And I think most studies on the produce farm side say like one person at max can work about a quarter acre of production. Are we at a quarter acre? We'll be just under next year, but that's kind of yeah. like the limit because then everything that does feel like my limit. Everything <laughs> beyond that becomes like you can't get to it unless you're trying to build like a big U pick farm and have people come in and do the work. But that's sure. a different business model, and we're going to think about some of that next year. Yeah. The, the real question will be next year is like, can people accept a business that's yeah? What's the way to put it? always not always growing or um that's a good point yeah you know, there'll so, be like this demand versus supply tension that we're going to probably deal with next year where there'll be people who are just like i just want to come by all the time i want you to be open six days a week yeah. so that i can just be buying flowers whenever so that you're just a market or frustrated front. if we sell out like it's not yeah we open. like well yeah we're trying to avoid where the, the mentality is if you don't get there in the first hour like you get nothing um, so like, there's going to be some of that. And then there's going to be decisions that I make with my own job. Right. You know, so, so next year will be, be yeah. I mean, next year is the real, so stay tuned right. for next year. I mean, we never say <laughs> It's going to be the big challenge. It's going to be the, yeah. this is the big transition year where it's either small scale, stay small scale. And like people are content or do you scale up and keep growing? Like, do we get a high tunnel that we buy? So like, we don't have plans to do that next year. I'd like to do no capital improvements. Cause I think we're going to be at about a quarter acre. Yeah. And I think that'll be good. Um, maybe one more tunnel if it goes gangbusters, but that's not a massive. Investment. I mean, if we grow modestly and kind of sell similar to this year, I think that will tell us maybe like where a comfortable cap is or it's like we can't keep up with the demand at all. We see a lot of opportunity for expansion. Then, like, yeah, we have to have some conversations that maybe look different than what we thought it was going to be starting out while keeping in mind the non-negotiables of, like, I'm not a full-time farm employee and I'm a homeschool teacher <laughs> more so than a flower farmer during the week and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think I, – let me say this. For example, like I'm sure in the in the YouTube world, you've seen you can eat the grass videos. We love we love watching Ian and Serena. We've watched them for so long. Method of they set a very firm five year plan and was like, this is what we want our farm to look like, and we're going to incrementally purchase and plant and work up to that goal we've set. That's one way of planning your flower farm. Ours is a bit different. Ours is much more incremental of we don't want to plant a half acre farm like they've got there. Well, they're on an acre actually at this point and then try to find all the customers for the stems that we've planted. We would rather, I think, maybe move a little bit slower and build customers, even if that means like we sell out and we have a higher demand that we can fill and work that way than the inverse. You still can kind of sketch it out a little bit. What would go where? Well, yeah, like field layout and stuff. But like, it's clear that Ian and Serena all along wanted to plant like that whole section, like that whole strip they wanted to. And so each year they added more beds to fill out that section. That was like always their goal. I don't think ours is necessarily like in year three, we're going to plant this section. And then in year four, we're going to plant this section. It's more like we could if we continue to grow but we haven't pre-planned it. You can extract 
way more out of less space as the principal. <laughs> we don't need you don't need an acre in production. I don't think I think you could. I, I would venture to guess that you could be putting sixty thousand to a hundred thousand gross on less than a half acre if you have the right marketing. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need a full acre at all. I don't think so either. Just calculating our own numbers for next year, I think that it's very achievable uh, on a quarter to a half acre at the most. And you start adding employees. You start they going cost bigger. Money. Like I know there's a flower farm I've seen on YouTube that was featured in I think Quebec, Canada that has like 16 employees or like somewhere eight to 16, it's only two acres uh, and they gross 389,000 uh, a year. So, but that's a lot more payroll to pay. They have a big walk-in cooler. It's a different world um, than what we're trying to build. Yeah, well, I mean like, yeah, we're not. You want 16 employees? No, I mean. Have you not told me this vision <laughs> that you have? Well, we're taking it a year at a time, oh, right? No! <laughs> I don't want to do payroll. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do want it to be largely a family operation with no employees, but or help somebody in our, our local church or community that wants, or teenagers that are like, hey, I could use some responsible hard labor. homeschool teenagers are thing. primo workers. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, um, yeah. Just I would start small work on small patches, extract, try to focus on maximizing dollar per and square foot. And master it, being like, I am really good at this six flower formula bouquet. I nailed it and it's great versus I can tell you I grew 15 varieties, but like those two died, that I didn't get much off of, this one had bug pressure, and then I didn't have enough of these five to make the bouquet. It's like just nail some things and then add to it. Yeah, Debbie, that's right. Less is more. Less is more. It's funny though, because when you tell somebody you're a flower farmer, they they, they think you're going to show them like some two acre. Well, tell patch. them what the Oklahoma ranchers think, because we live on ranches where people are like, I have a hundred acres, I have seventy five acres of cattle, and so they'll ask us like, how, how many, many acres, acres do, you? do you grow on? How many hundreds of acres? Do right, you and I like faint a little bit. Flowers like, are acres? not cows, sir. They don't require one acre per flower. <laughs> I like faint a little bit thinking about like three acres of flowers. Yeah, I mean, our property is pint size, but I mean, if we were to grow on one, the one side that you see on our overheads, that would be about a whole acre and that would just be more than we could handle and more than um, we could sell unless like we started hiring people. We'd be one of the biggest farms. And our neighbor does a produce that. farm and he's got five years experience in produce farming and he's doing the, you know, like the biodynamic produce farm. And he says as much as he's learned and he got all the formal education on it is that one person with maybe some help from a brother or a wife or a husband can work about a quarter acre. I mean, that's the max without, you know, we're not talking like monoculture, monocropping, uh, monocropping yeah. like big tractors that, you know, impact the earth with like massive wheels and tracks. Right. This is like talking about like, you know, hands in the dirt kind of yeah. farming. That's what flower farming is. It's high dense. And it's very profitable well, if you now, can bring the customers. Now that we're heading into year three, which feels really exciting to say heading into year three, if I could have like two wishes in my observations of new flower farmers, I would say one, pay more attention to marketing. I'm a broken record. Take it more seriously. You will do so much better if you work hard at marketing. And second would be to grow less varieties. I think so many are just captivated by the aspirational big farms. We all have ready access to them on YouTube and Instagram. And we see everything we're doing and we think one that's just what you have to do to be a flower farm and two i mean we all have sparkly eyes to all the flower varieties in the catalog and you want to and it's hard to say no and so many new growers just jump in growing like a full grow sheet that maybe a year seven farm does and it's like ah that's you're gonna hate it you're not gonna have enough product you're gonna have loss it's just don't pick a dozen yeah, and it's also maybe like humility is the wrong word to use, but it's like don't think you're small fry if you only do a summer season with six varieties and that's somehow like not as impressive because if you're profitable and you're selling out, that's way more profitable than the girl that planted every flower on Johnny's catalog and didn't do as well. So yeah, like be half confident of them in that. You can figure out they died or some bug you've never seen before in your life said, I like this plant. <laughs> and I'll take it. <laughs> the white flies. Yeah, white flies. Wow. <laughs> we'll see what next year's Oklahoma bug of the year. <laughs> bug of the year. We should do a video like bug nominating. Year. This year it was white flies. Nominating the bug of the year. Award. Last year it was. You should make a little trophy. Yeah. <laughs>
Many years. This year's bug of the year is the white fly. The white Maybe fly. a tiny little trophy. Last year's bug of the year was the cucumber beetle, but this uh, year it's the white fly. They took over the zinnias. Next year will probably be a thrip because we're building a high tunnel, but oh boy. we'll see what we can do. But yeah. Oh yeah, we had like 30 people hang out with us awesome. on a Friday and night. Look, we doubled our likes because we asked. Yeah, See remember to hit work. that like button before you leave. We'd appreciate that boost. <laughs> your, your homework for the night, right, dear fans, and everyone, uh, Debbie and Darcy and uh, Xander, yeah, Yannika, Rick. Just this going through the, the names. This is the part of the video where people are like, "You're just staring weirdly my... at us." <laughs> Hopefully, we came in clearer this time. We yeah. We got Starlink internet finally yeah. after a year. So an Elon Musk live. <laughs> Elon Musk <laughs> is helping us with our broadcasts out here. So the kids are watching Narnia in the other room. If you heard any like thematic music, <laughs> but, why don't you close us out? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to think of like we're starting to give you like a preview of what's coming in October. We are like big October project is is um, building the caterpillar tunnel. I want to keep saying high tunnel, but it's not. It's a caterpillar tunnel from Farmer's Friend. I'm going to be like camera woman because most of it's Eric, but we're going to film the whole process and then put a video together. So if you want to see like, if this is something I want to invest on our farm, like what does the process look like? I'm interested in it. We're going to have that video. We're going to have planting a bunch of plugs into the field. The plugs that I bought, they go in the field and stuff that go in the tunnel. And then in November is going to be peonies. December is going to be tulips. So it's going to be a lot of planting videos. But as we kind of go into well, the- you got your first tulips in. Yeah, we have 2,000 sitting on the front porch, which is exciting. I have to get them in the cooler. They're but They're going to get chilled tonight. They are going to get chilled tonight. But as we get more towards like the off season or not doing enough for a video, that's when we'll do like a marketing video we want to do like a year in review like a formal year in review video i want to do a video of flowers i'm never growing again i'll probably do a video about like what we're growing like what the yes flowers are and then like a no flowers video we'll probably do a video of like our 2024 plans those sorts of those sorts of videos which i like watching in the off season too as i'm planning for my farm i like watching other youtube channels being like what do they have planned what are they doing so that's yeah that's that all right awesome thanks for hanging out guys thanks for being so encouraging and following us and five thousand is so exciting so yeah awesome thankful. thanks for spending time with us and hopefully this helps you guys a wild friday night <laughs> <laughs> all right take care